My title? Director of Clinical Pharmacy Services. Hey, John, can we ease up on the dishwashing? <laughs> Nora, where's my phone? <laughs> where's the phone, Nora? <laughs> I've got to run my blender a couple of times. <laughs> Welcome to the Business Over Beer Happy Hour, a daily dose of support for business owners, entrepreneurs, and people passionate about what they do. Hosted by Ben Surratt, Jonathan Kaler, and Jason Canope, it's time to grab a beer, enjoy some cheer, and join together. Hey, everybody. It's Friday, and it's the Business Over Beer Happy Hour. We're happy. We're all happy. I am looking at a screen of some beautiful looking people, but there is only one person I want to talk to right now. That Liz? No, no. not right now. <laughs> not right now. I want to talk to Mr. Respect the Hair, Mr. Space Cowboy, Mr. I am Spartacus, but today still stitches. Mr. Jonathan Kaler. Happy Friday, Jonathan. Happy hour to you, Ben. I am so glad it's Friday. I am ready to enjoy an ice cold beer. The weather is gorgeous. Gorgeous. Despite the fact of being shut ins, I say no. Get outside, enjoy the sunshine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful time to be in the Pacific Northwest. Sure. And speaking of beautiful, beautiful things in the Pacific Northwest, we have the gift that keeps on giving. He is <laughs> the gangsta of Hazeldell, Jason Canope. Welcome to Friday Happy Hour, my friend. How are you feeling tonight? Thank you. I'm feeling great. I'm very happy it's Friday just because we get to hang out once again, drink some beer. The weather's fantastic. I don't want to complain about anything because everything is good and we have a pretty fantastic person here with us today do we not Kaler? oh we do, do we? we have one <laughs> of my dearest oldest friends miss elizabeth bentley liz thank you so much for joining us welcome to happy hour thanks guys glad to be here <laughs> so uh so bentley 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 that that rings a bell why does that <laughs> ring a bell then uh, are you in a relation to a John Bentley or? Um, I think I may have heard of him somewhere. I think I may have met him somewhere along the way. I know where you heard. I know where you heard of him. The business <laughs> over the business over beer podcast. That's right. That's right. Absolutely That's right. correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were lucky enough uh, to have your your husband on and uh, back on an episode circa episode fourteen, I believe. Um, so, uh, sorry that, uh, that it took us, uh, all these months to get you on. Um, we really wanted to get you on first, but, uh, <laughs> you know, no need to apologize. Uh, in all seriousness, no, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us on the happy hour. Uh, this is business over beer. So we like to kind of start with your business. So you are, uh, the director of clinical pharmacy services for Kaiser Permanente here in, uh, the Portland area. Uh, why yes. don't you give us sort of the, the 50,000 foot view mm -hmm. of, uh, of what you do at Kaiser and kind of what you're into. Sure. Um, so yes, I am director of pharmacy and I also am a pharmacist by training. Um, and so I think a lot of people, when they think of pharmacists, they think of, you know, you go to the drugstore, you might go to a Walgreens, you go in, you pick up your prescription, that type of service. Um, but pharmacists, you know, work in all kinds of professions, um, all kinds of practice settings. Um, and so the practice setting that I support is really more around the clinical care that's provided to patients. So um, people are familiar with going to the doctor, you know, to get their blood pressure managed or maybe get their diabetes under control, um, or maybe they're on a specialized medication that they need more help with. Um, so the pharmacists on my team are really, you know, involved with providing that clinical care um, and collaborate with a team of physicians, nurses, 
um, other types of providers, et cetera, more on the patient care side. Um, and I did want to make sure to mention before I forget about it, uh, this week is actually National Nurses Week. So I did want to give a, a shout out to my fellow healthcare professionals. Uh, we work very collaborati collaboratively a lot of the time. A couple of days ago was National Nurses Day. So just wanted to say a big thank you out there to all the nurses as well. Absolutely right. Thank you, That's, nurses. Yes, thank you so much. Having uh, just encountered um, mm -hmm. a, uh, a situation where I had to, uh, in, you know, deal with nurses, they were, they were all fantastic. And, and nurses are, uh, are such an important part uh, of, of the whole healthcare system. So yes, toast positive for sure. Uh, to to all the nurses. I didn't know that it was uh, National Nurses Week. That's great. Me neither. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Liz, I wanted to, uh, you know, I mentioned that uh, we're, we're very old friends and very dear friends. Um, you know, you were nice enough to send over your bio for us to kind of peruse to help us prepare for this interview. Um, yeah. You know, I was, uh, I was a little disappointed with the fact that uh, <laughs> your undergraduate uh, degree was not referenced in your, in your biography. I just wanted to know what is your problem with the University of Dayton? There, I have no problem, and I will show you. I'm actually wearing a U All right. shirt nice. today just to represent, because I know you guys like to talk about this kind of stuff on the show. So I All right. wanted to make sure that I was here showing my support um, for my favorite of the three colleges that I've graduated from and have a degree from. All right. Um, well. So I have zero problems with the University of Dayton, and only sad that we didn't get to claim our national championship this year. Yes, Ooh. well... <laughs> All right. Well, good. I just wanted to clear the air. You may want to think about adding that to, to your bio before you send it to me the next time. Okay. Well, good. this is the happy hour, Ben. Yes. And I am thirsty. You look it. And, and the talk of sports really got me down. So I need something that makes me happy. Well, so, let's, so what is that? For you, Liz, something special. <laughs> okay. My good friend, Joel, the goat said, have you ever had a rubber head? And I go, what's a rubber head? He goes, it's hammerhead ale and a ruby from McMinimins. I said, no, I have not. Oh. So I went up to McMinimins and I did there. We got some food. We got some beer. And I poured half of, or a little more than half of the hammerhead in there. <laughs> <laughs> mm, which one do you but like? But I'm going to add the, the ruby <laughs> and have my first ever rubber head. Have you guys ever had a rubber head? I've had, no. a, rubina I've had a rubinator, but not a rubber head. I've, I've had both of those beers separately, but never together. So here we go. Ruby's see. a fantastic beer by itself, too. Yes, it is one of my favorites. So I don't know if that's why you chose it for me, but you know, I like those fruity beers. Yes, I dig this 100%. <laughs> I dig it. Well, I, I'm not a, I mean, I like the Ruby. It's okay, but that with the uh, Hammerhead IPA in there or the Hammerhead Ale in there, to it kind of cut through that, some of that sweetness. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, it's good. It's good. What are you drinking, Kaler? Uh, I, um, I have got uh, the Hazy L, Hazy IPA from a Bale Breaker Brewing. And I owe Bale Breaker an apology because we've had them, we've had their beers on the show a few times and I always thought they were out of Seattle. They are not, as it turns out. Uh, they, they actually brew in Canon Moxie and, uh, and their facility, I think, is, I think their tap room is over in Yakima. So mm -hmm. I think... I don't know. I haven't gone back and listened to the tapes, but I think every time we drink Bell Breaker, I say they're out of Seattle. So I have been wrong. So I wanted to make a culpa to Bell Breaker because I love them so much. I love their beers. They're good. Uh, so that's what I'm drinking. The Hazy L, Hazy IPA. Cano, what do you got tonight, my man? I am representing Backwoods Brewing again with their Pilsner. Thanks to a good buddy of mine named Kaler. Mm -hmm. All right, Dayton Flyer, you're up. All what right. are you drinking? Well, hands collected by the aforementioned John Bentley, um, he thought I might like this Breakside Passion Fruit Sour Ale. Does that sound like anything I would like? That or? sounds like that's right up your alley. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to open this. And uh, I wanted to point out as well, I know this isn't local to our area, but it is local to my brother's area, which is that I'm drinking it out of an Emmett's beer glass. 
Um, Amos is local to West Dundee, Illinois. So if you guys ever get a chance to go there, um, hopefully sometime soon, um, I would recommend it. Dundee, of course, part of Chicago land, and, and Ben representing uh, the Chicago Cubs tonight. So, prost, everyone. Happy, prost. happy hour. Prost. Beak. Cheers. So, we got a few hellos uh, to give here. Um, Lori Kaler, no relation, says hi, Liz. <laughs> uh, Angela Surratt, no relation. Uh, <laughs> looks like Ben Surratt is watching. That's weird. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so if, uh, if anybody else is out there uh, watching the program, uh, please give us a wave, say hello, let us know what you're drinking. Uh, if you have any questions uh, about uh, about the, the pharmaceutical industry, about healthcare, please uh, ask Liz. If you have questions about beer, feel free to ask <laughs> us, uh, but let us know if you have any questions. And of course, Ben, we have a riddle of the day. The riddle of the day for a... <clears throat> Fortside $10 gift card. What can run but never walks? Has a mouth but never talks. Has a head but never weeps. <laughs> Has a bed but never sleeps. Jonathan, what's the answer? Beer. Fortunately, no, it's not the answer. But if somebody does answer this correctly, they win the Fortside gift card. Well, I still say I'm right. I thought the answer was always beer. Uh, for it me, is. it I, is. I support Kaler. Thanks, Canope. It's nice to have you in my corner for a change. Once in a while. <clears throat> so, Liz... Did yeah. you start out wanting to get into pharmacy, uh, the pharmacy business and pharmaceuticals? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, so I will give you the shorter version of the story. Let us just say, so uh, growing up, my dad was a pharmacist. He worked in a pharmacy. Um, I used to try to go visit him and start counting tablets to help him out. He told me that that was not really recommended. <laughs> Um, but, you know, he let me hang out. Um, he also worked in hospitals. He did things with computer systems related to pharmacy. And so, of course, when I went to college, I majored in music because, you know, that, I mean, that was the obvious choice. Um, after having observed my father and his successful career. Um, so, all joking aside, I, I greatly enjoyed my time as a music major, got to meet a lot of wonderful people at the also aforementioned the University of Dayton, um, go Flyers, and uh, so after that, you know, I did work for a time, and then I thought, you know, um, I'm not sure if this is really what I want to do, if I want to keep teaching piano lessons and voice lessons and picking up odd jobs here and there, and so I thought, you know, the obvious next choice is to go to Northwestern to get my master's degree in journalism, right? Because, you know, why not? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I'd had some experience working as a technician, a pharmacy technician um, at CVS. Um, and I thought, you know, why not? Obvious next step is to go to journalism school. So, and um, as your previous guest mentioned, you know, there are different tracks in journalism school that you can go into. And at the time, you could do um, either what they called new media. Now we call it media, just media. Right. It's basically the internet. <laughs> um, oh, is that what they yeah. called it back then? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Media. That's awesome. New media journalism. That's awesome. Um, so that was one choice. Another option was the broadcast route. Uh, another option was magazines. And then there was the serious option, which I selected, which was print journalism. And, you know, I thought, you know what, I'm going to be a serious journalist. I'm going to write hard hitting articles. Um, and I even had a chance to cover the pharmaceutical beat in the Chicago area. Um, as you may know, there are a lot of drug companies there. And um, so I had some time. That's not what I thought she was going to say, Ben. <laughs> but I, think I, I, thought, I, thought, I thought she was going to say because you know there's a lot of drugs in Chicago. That's, <laughs> that's, that's the route I thought she was going. I'm glad. <laughs> glad she went now, another way. 
No, no, no. This is a serious podcast. <laughs> Taylor, um, you're awesome. Did she just say this is a serious podcast? You've you're never watched awesome. our show before, Liz. You're awesome. Uh, come on. All right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're Seriously. Awesome. Okay, Seriously, guys. The drug I mean, companies in Chicago. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So um, I had a little bit of a uh, taste of that. But essentially, I worked in um, journalism, publishing for about eight years. Um, and then I sort of started thinking back to all the experiences I'd had and um, people I'd worked with who had encouraged me to pursue some type of medical career of some kind. Um, and I really thought, you know, pharmacy is something I can picture myself really enjoying. Um, at the time, uh, previous to when I went and got my doctor of pharmacy, they were only doing a uh, bachelor's of pharmacy. Some people would go back and get their doctorate, but it had become a more established, um, what they call, uh, it's called a Farm D instead of an MD, it's a Farm D. Um, it's an additional four years of training, and so I thought, okay, well, this is a way I can move into it and advance um, my professional uh, capabilities by going and getting my Farm D. And so I had a couple prereqs to do, but once I finished that, went into pharmacy school, um, and it really just it opened my eyes to all of the different types of jobs that pharmacists could have. Because I had honestly envisioned myself um, potentially graduating, um, having my farm D, and working part time at a store down the street, and having a family, and just going from there. And then once I got more into pharmacy school, I started to realize, wow, this is really interesting stuff. I think I want to learn more. I think I want to become a better clinician. Um, and so I ended up doing two additional years of of residency after that. Um, I don't, people probably don't know this broadly, but um, there are specializations that pharmacists can go into. And so I did a, an initial residency training that was more in hospital medicine. So learning how to be a hospital pharmacist. Um, and then I did a second year of residency that was more around um, what we call formulary management. So it's like evaluating medications to see if they're safe, effective, if they should be used, that sort of thing. Um, that's a very simplified version of what, what that entails. Um, but uh, that's what my second year was in, and then just kind of moved on from there. So talk a little bit about, about the breadth of training, because I'm sure that there is a misconception about, about pharmacists. And you alluded to it a little bit earlier that, you know, the, the pharmacists there – you know, I always think of the the Jerry Seinfeld uh, stand up bit where he's like the the pharmacy the pharmacist you know is is two feet up above everybody else and you know where where does he get off? All he's doing is counting pills, right? Um, right. You know, and, and so I think there is sort of that that misconception that you know all they're doing is is filling prescriptions and 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 uh, counting pills. But um, you know, having known you for as long as I have, there's the the level of knowledge required of a pharmacist is uh, is intense and broad to say the least. So kind of talk a little bit about what goes into that training and, and, you know, just kind of high level the, the breadth of your knowledge. Um, and maybe you can compare it to other, to other folks. Like, like what do you have to know, uh, compared to a doctor or to a nurse or to others that are maybe in the medical field? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for the question. And I mean, I think the way, um, to explain it more high level is, you know, if you think of a physician who goes to school, they do their training, they're really honing in on diagnosis, um, how, to, how to make that differential, um, and yes, on the treatments. But with pharmacy, it's almost the flip side. Our exclusive, almost exclusive focus is on medication management. What's the right therapy, the right dosing? Um, what other things do we need to take into account for this patient to make sure it's safe and effective? And then we learn, you know, this much about diagnosing and pharmacists don't diagnose. Um, so if you think about that kind of balancing out of being the medication expert versus being a diagnostician or, you know, making medical diagnoses. Um, so I think, of course, you mentioned the stereotypical pharmacist count tablets or pills and put them in a bottle and that's what pharmacists do, right? Um, but even at a, a pharmacy location, um, when, when you go in there to get your prescription, that pharmacist is working behind the scenes doing a double check to make sure it's safe for you to get your medication, that it doesn't interact with other medications that you have on your profile in a way that could be dangerous. 
Um, if you think about our healthcare system, it's really fragmented. So you might go to one doctor for, for one um, illness or ailment that you have, and you might go to, say, your primary care physician for another one, and they, they would both write you prescriptions for medication. But it might be only at the time that you get it filled at the pharmacy that someone would notice, hey, these medications interact, they're not safe to take together, or they're maybe even going to counteract each other and not be as effective and that sort of thing. So um, that's a big piece that even behind the scenes in that setting where you see the pharmacist counting those tablets, they're doing a lot of other things back there that, that you don't really necessarily know about. And it's really more about using that clinical mindset to make an evaluation and make sure that um, the treatment is the best and most effective. Um, and in, in many cases, uh, it's probably not also known, but there's a lot of conversation between the pharmacy and the doctor's office. So beyond just, you know, insurance coverage and that sort of thing, I mean, they might say, oh, I noticed this, this uh, patient's on this because their kidneys aren't working as well. I would recommend that you put them on this dose. And then that'll all get sorted out at the pharmacy. And you may or may not even know that that, that occurred. Um, uh, and then the pharmacist should be counseling at the time when they give you that medication on, you know, what to expect. Um, but even beyond that, that location pharmacy where you might be picking up a prescription, uh, pharmacists work in hospitals hand in hand with the medical team. So, um, you know, on TV dramas, they, you're used to seeing the scene where the physicians go around and they have the medical residents with them and they're all in the room talking about what, what they think the patient might have and what the best treatment might be. Um, there are also pharmacists on those teams. And when I trained, I participated on those kinds of teams. So you, you'll all talk together and, um, you know, really a lot of it might be something like the pharmacist might say, oh, I noticed they've been on their antibiotic. Looks like things are okay. Maybe it's time to take them off. Um, so that's kind of the discussion that goes on. And kind of like I was alluding to earlier, you know, working hand in hand with nurses, doctors, it's really all part of that team. It's just not as visible to the public. Um, I could go on and on. I mean, Pharmacists worked in doctor's offices, or like what I was mentioning with the work that um, our team does, and they also work in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, it, the list is just endless. It would be impossible to cover everything. <laughs> with, with the whole pandemic thing going on, um, where do you see pharmacies going in the future? Um, are we, are we going to, are we going to start doing more of a, um, like drive, we're seeing it now, I guess, but like more of a drive up, pick up, less interaction with the pharmacy, with the people in the, at your local pharmacy, well, whatever you get your pharmaceuticals at, are we going to see less of that? And if we are, where is that going to go? Is it going to be more pick up delivery? Like, mm -hmm like that or how is it going to look pale yeah yeah i mean that's a great question um you know a lot of the questions people have right now about healthcare in general are sort of crystal ball questions because we really don't know what's going to happen um however that being said um the cdc the the centers for disease control has published lists of guidelines for pharmacies specifically and there are also recommendations around healthcare systems and I think, um, you know, I'm not speaking for Kaiser in specific, but just broadly as the healthcare system, there's been a lot of ways to look for innovation. So um, it could be that you really need your medication right now. So rather than have you come into a pharmacy or an office building, we'll take that medication out to you, you know, while you wait in your car, for example. Um, mail order pharmacy is something that, um, you know, people used even before for the COVID-19 um, pandemic. But, oh, really? Um, yes, yes. So, I mean, it all depends on health plan, whatever kind of benefits um, people have available. But um, there is a pretty high volume of prescriptions that goes out through the mail. Um, but as an industry, you know, really for obvious reasons, I mean, it kind of makes sense. You know, people don't want to have that contact. So, mailing rates for, for pharmacy, are, you know, they're going up nationally because it's another contactless way to get your prescription. And I mean, if you think about it, um, 
a lot of prescriptions that people get, they may have been taking for five years. So they're just really wanting to continue to get that medication to keep their blood pressure in control or keep their diabetes in control. Um, and it really doesn't require that, that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and just looking at other ways, I mean, if you've, you've all been into a pharmacy, right? And if you think about it, pharmacists are the most accessible healthcare professionals. I mean, I really can't think of another, you know, person who's earned a doctorate level education and is a healthcare provider that you can just go into on demand and ask her advice on, you know, your symptoms or your medication or, or that sort of thing. Um, and so with this kind of a crisis, a pandemic, it's really brought forward how accessible pharmacists are. I and mean, you've probably seen like sneeze guards and things up, even in a grocery store, but certainly in the pharmacies to, you know, make sure everyone's keeping safe distance. Um, but there are also many states where um, pharmacies and pharmacists are performing testing. So they've um, had waivers in different states where they have pharmacists go out and actually perform the, the COVID testing. Um, so to, that's another service. Are, are they going to people's homes or? No, um, it's, it's like in the parking lot kind of situation. And I mean, it's different depending on where it is, but, you know, just kind of leveraging, okay, what are other ways that we can be out there in the public and help people? Um, and another thing that, that pharmacists do um, is administer vaccines. So, you know, pharmacists um, are, have been involved with vaccine development, um, even related to COVID, as well as like investigational drugs, because you, you've probably heard of the remdesivir medication that's shown a little bit of promise. Um, maybe you haven't. Um, is that, so is that the one that's here in Vancouver? Uh, it's, it's everywhere. So it's available okay. um, through an investigational drug program right now. Um, and they're really looking at it. I don't, um, so you guys have probably heard of Tamiflu for the flu, right? It's a yes, similar heard idea. Of that one. <laughs> yeah, so it's a similar idea where uh, it's being used right now in hospitalized patients, but where it can lessen the, the severity and the duration is the thought. So it's by no means a slam dunk, like they've been saying on, on TV. They keep saying it's not a slam dunk, and it's not. It's not a cure, but you know, it's something that's showing some promise, which I think is a, a great thing in these times. So, uh, you had, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, you had mentioned that in the hospital setting, the pharmacists work hand in hand with the doctors. So in a typical pharmacy setting, I assume that there, there's a lot of notes, chart notes and stuff that you have to go through from the diagnostic side that they do and provide for you in order to get to finding out whether a patient should have certain uh, medications or not. Is that, I mean, so I would just, you know, basically mm -hmm. I'm just asking, there's probably a lot of research in the back end that you have to do just going through all of the notes of a patient's history to make sure that, uh, that they don't have to get the wrong medications and have a reaction. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so definitely chart review is, is a big part of, well, now that we're in this electronic medical record age um, that all the providers are relying on. So they're all able to look at notes from what different, different participants on the care team have found. And often person with a different lens, say in this case pharmacist, might be able to look at something and say, oh, these symptoms that they've been trying to address, I think it's actually due to this drug that they're on. And maybe if you take this drug off, those might go away. So, I mean, there's always like a, a puzzle piece when it, when it comes to that. But um, yeah, that's definitely a role that pharmacists play. And I mean, I can't even imagine um, because, you know, coming into the profession when I did, I've always been in an environment where there were electronic medical records. I can't imagine how much hard work it would have been if you all you had was your clipboard and your notes and your files and and you know how much more challenging that must have been. Um, but having any kind of information is always helpful. So we always. sort of kind of talk about uh, about the vaccine, um, and so as. And I'm sure people are working very diligently on, on trying to develop this, this vaccine for, for COVID. Do you have thoughts on, uh, maybe you can share a little bit about the process of developing a vaccine very high level and sort of generally 
you know, cause there's, there's talk in the news of, you know, we want to get, we want to get it quick and get it out to people, but um, you know, there's, there has to be for safety. I mean, there, there has to be a testing period. There has to be um, certain procedures I would assume that are in place. What are your, maybe you can enlighten us on a little bit about what that process look, looks like and, you know, and, and do you suspect that given the severity of this pandemic, um, you know, it'll continue to be important to follow those procedures. Do you suspect that those procedures will be followed the way they need to be? So is this where I say it's a crystal ball question again? <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it truly is, but I, I can comment on it a little bit and I would I would also say, um, I didn't mention this at the outset, but there are also pharmacists that specialize in infectious disease. Um, so they devote their additional training strictly to focusing in on how to treat different bacterial or viral infections and manage all of that. Um, so I'm not one of those, but I can speak high level um, to what goes on. Um, so like you mentioned, the first phase is really just making sure it's safe and I think that's really the part to emphasize because that doesn't really give us any data on whether it's effective. Um, and that happens usually in what they call the phase two of trials. Um, and why that's so important is um, that often there are, there are adverse events that can be associated with a vaccine or any kind of medication for that matter that may be less common but very serious that don't manifest until you test it out in a larger group of people. Um, and vaccine development in, in general is challenging because all viral types are different. You know, they have different shapes and sizes. They have different mutation rates. Um, so I am generally optimistic by nature. However, I will say I do think, um, you know, we're looking at many, many, many months um, before we have a vaccine. Um, and you know, there's always a question, oh, I hate to be a Debbie Downer on a Friday, but if we will be able to make a, a vaccine, because, I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, coronavirus is similar to the virus that causes the common cold, right? Um, and we don't have a virus for that. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why, um, but partly it's due to mutational rate um, and things like that. So, um, and even when you think about the flu, you know how every year it has different rates of efficacy because they're trying to predict what strains are going to be out there in the public. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to vaccine development in general, um, let alone to this particular vaccine. But um, and, aren't, and aren't we already yeah. starting to see some mutations within the coronavirus? Didn't I? I feel like I read an article this week that even talked mm -hmm. about you know, the coronavirus, the initial strain that hit the country is is changing and is a little different than it was when it started. Yeah, and I haven't read too much about the different strains, but yes. Um, however, it does seem, from what I've read so far, that it, it's a slower mutator, which is a good thing in terms of vaccine development. So let's put that on the positive side. So you, yeah. may or, so you may or may not be able to, to answer this question, and, and, and if you can't, just say no comment, but uh, I'm curious what what you would say to um, to the idea of you know what let's let's end the shutdown now and let's all just go get the virus and build up our immunity um, that that's that's the best way for us to to get through this pandemic. I'm curious what your thoughts would be as a as someone who um, you know who's sort of in this business. What your thoughts would might be on that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really hard to say what the right approach is because this is a situation we've never been in before. Um, I mean, I do struggle with the idea of opening things up more because the longer we can limit social contact, the more time it does give us a chance to not only for vaccine development, but just to figure out more about how the virus works and how it affects people. Um, so, you know, on the more cautious side, I do think that it makes sense to take a very slow and cautious approach. And I mean, that's my personal opinion. I'm sure others would differ, but yeah. I have a question that will, that goes to your journalism <laughs> side and your pharmaceutical side. 
So back when we all remember when AIDS first came out, we're that old, and how there was so much information coming out back then. And some information was right, some was wrong. So what do you tell somebody, or how would you tell somebody, like, where should you get your information from? Hmm. Where should you look? <laughs> Man, that's a good question, Ben. That's yeah. a really good question. Um, and, you know, I watch CNN just like anybody else. But what I will say, and I don't think this is specific to coronavirus, but my opinion about the media and how it covers things is um, things are a lot more sensationalized. Um, and I feel like many times, um, especially with broadcast news, when you turn it on, you know, CNN, they're talking about the situation. They have the ticker on there with the number of cases, the number of deaths, the map. Um, it can be very anxiety provoking. And so I think a really good place to go for information that, um, well, of course, it's a serious situation, but that it's very logical, fact-based. I find it to be reassuring. Um, is to go to things like the Centers for Disease Control website if you're looking for a specific question. Um, also, the World Health Organization has some really nice information, and it balances Ooh. out the World Health, yeah, the WHO. I, the had, who. I had to do, I saw, I'm, the I WHO, had to do yeah. it. I had to do <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, I was just going to sources that are really trying to give you the best um, facts that we have to date, and... I also rely on um, pharmacy organizations. So um, there's a pharmacy organization I'm a member of, um, the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, that publishes resources um, related to COVID-19. So um, really going on there and seeing what the latest understandings are, is, it's very helpful. And I think when you can read things that are concise, short, factual, and not emotionally charged, um, it, it's a better source of information than necessarily always going to the news outlet. It, it's, it's just tough now because we have it, we have our social media and we're all, and there's so many people on it right now. It's tough to not get emotional, but you, you, ha you said it correctly. You can't make this an emotional this thing. You have to use your common sense and, and just make the best choices with the information that you're given, right? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and, she, and she watches CNN, Ben. That's, that's what we would call old media. That's old <laughs> media, not new media. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. the old media. Hey, uh, yeah. I just want to just say a couple of other folks uh, have jumped on. Uh, Tracy Grant, T-Money, says happy Friday. Happy Friday to you, T-Money. Thanks for watching. Uh, Kevin Reed, Sean Emmett, uh, Michelle, Michelle Risden, Tracy, uh, and Matt DeMarco has joined. Hello, Matt DeMarco. Uh, he hey, wants Matt. me to ask you off the air uh, if you can get us some of the good stuff, <laughs> but we'll ask we'll ask that later. <laughs> okay. And uh, Lori, uh, Lori asks, do we have a vaccine for Spanish flu or the swine flu? Hmm. Oh, so um, previous flu strains. Um, that have circulated for years and years um, are part of the, the mix of what can be considered for um, each year's annual flu vaccine. And please don't ask me what strains are in it this year because I, I don't know what the upcoming um, set is off the top of my head. Um, so what they do is by looking at, at patterns from flu in different parts of the world, they try to predict what's going to be circulating, um, say, in the United States for the upcoming flu season. Um, and so they'll put them all in the same vaccine. So, I mean, you're not going to get like five different shots. But um, as you may remember, for H1N1, you had to get it separately um, because it, it came out um, staggered from when the usual flu vaccine administration is. And then they, it also required the booster um, so that, that's my recollection. I wasn't actually a, a pharmacist at that time, um, <laughs> but I was in pharmacy school and I do remember um, that whole process of how they had to um, do an extra step for the H1N1 
Um, so yes, they do their best to try to predict which ones are up and coming um, for flu. Uh, it's hit or miss, so sometimes the efficacy is super low, and sometimes we get lucky and, and we have really good coverage for the year. Man, man, there is so much stuff. <laughs> like I, I, I mean, stuff, yeah. Uh, um, the last question I have is one that I, I told you I'm going to ask you because oh, okay. a lot of a lot of people are deciding, especially as of late, to do more uh, homeopathic stuff. What is your take on that? Just overall. Mm -hmm. Uh, before and I Kaiser into... Permanente's take too, if you can, if you can comment on that. <laughs> I'm here representing only myself. <laughs> oh right, I'm sorry, I forgot, I forgot. I'll I'll fix that in post. So Liz, <laughs> sorry, so Liz, just yeah, give us your thank personal you, opinion. But thank you for asking that. Um, <laughs> Taylor, so, you are on point I... today, bro. You are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so regarding homeopathy, and I mean, it's really kind of just a whole set of what I would consider alternative medicine. Um, what I would say, and this is not a med medicine per se, but um, I think staying healthy and getting enough exercise and eating well is really important in times like these. Because um, the healthier you are, you know, it, indications are the better you're going to fare. Um, and I was looking for another um, opportunity to plug um, a previous podcast of yours, but I just wanted to share with everyone, I recently upgraded to a 30 pound kettlebell. So I'm not quite <laughs> up to the, what was it? 70 pound kettlebell? It was 70 pounds. Yes. <laughs> I, I wasn't can't either. I wasn't either. <laughs> even imagine. Um, so anyway, I, I'm using my kettlebell. It is not 70 pounds. Um, so, I mean, that's a big piece of it too. And I think it, it does tie into alternative medicine in that it's like a supplemental way to support your wellness. Um, I tend to view alternative medicine with a little bit more skepticism. And it's probably because part of my training was in evidence-based medicine. And so I want to see the proof in the clinical trial. Uh, like we were talking about before, it goes through the different phases of the trial to, to get validated. And the issue with the alternative medicine is um, not only has it often not gone through any kind of trial process because the formulations all tend to be different, but there's no regulation so, and no testing of the results. So I could make a bottle of something at home and label it and basically say this is not a drug, it's not been shown to do anything in really small print on the bottle and uh, market it and it might not even be what the bottle says it is. Um, so I think that's one of my biggest issues with it, that it's not tested for purity or even to verify that that's actually what is inside. Um, the caveat I would say is so um, next time you go, if you're going in for vitamins or that sort of thing, um, when you pull up the bottle, some of them do say things on it like USP certified, for example, um, that would be a different situation. Uh, but that's an elective thing. I mean, uh, for hom homeopathy, that, that's not a requirement. Um, so, you know, it's just something to take with a grain of salt. That being said, um, sometimes there's one thing that will work for one person. Um, and so, you know, people just have to figure out what works best for them. But from a broad approach, um, I tend to fall back on evidence-based medicine. And sometimes that does include things that are more... Um, natural remedies or vitamins. Um, there are things that have really good evidence to support them. But, um, you know, if you go to like a, a Whole Foods and they've got aisles of products, I mean, a, a good proportion of those things have, have not been tested or verified to do what they, they say they may do, so. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, that, great answer. Do you think that might have to do with um, how they've, they've traditional med or Western medicine has kind of pushed them to the side and not included them. Cause I, I know I've heard a lot of people who have said things like, um, I can't get this sort of uh, specialty within my health insurance. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if maybe they, they're not allowed to do those sort of tests or just out of curious, just curiosity really. Yeah. I mean, I don't really know. And I mean, I, I don't really know anything about the claims on those specific things, but, um, 
they do test natural medicines. I mean, there are trials that test natural med medicines. I think, like I mentioned before, the, the biggest issue is that they don't have a, necessarily a standard formulation or manufacturing process. So if it's different from batch to batch, it's really difficult to verify if something is effective because you have a different product each time you make it. Yeah. Um, and if you think about a drug, they're making sure that it stays within this tiny, tiny window of being the same every time they manufacture it. So it's just, to me, it's almost just, it's something that's different. It's not, it's just not the same thing. I'm, I mean, one is a manufactured drug and, and the other is, you know, it's more like natural, natural remedies, like I said, but, um, I, I think, um, more standardization would be good and it, it would allow more things to be tested as well. That's good. Not good to know. <laughs> So what, what have you learned uh, during this pandemic that you'll take going forward? I mean, that's always a question that we like to ask of, of everybody as we try to wind down, you know, the interview. Um, you know, what are, what are you going to take from this that, that you'll use going forward? What have you learned? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And on a personal level, it doesn't really necessarily have much to do with my profession. Um, and I, I really enjoy listening to podcasts and one of my favorite podcasts is business over beer and, um, <laughs> and also that is correct. <laughs> good, good answer. Good answer. No, just not there. No, stop. Just not there. Hey, was, thanks, thanks everybody for joining yeah. us. I was worried she it was interested in the Sasquatch hunters. So this is great. Great news. Um, no, and, and also, um, the Brene Brown podcast she has, it's called Unlocking Us. And um, her guests have been really great at talking about how to approach things during the pandemic and, and contextualizing it in terms of how we relate with each other. And I think uh, one thing I've really taken home is uh, you hear a lot about, um, you know, frontline workers and, um, of course, you know, people that need to put themselves in harm's way to um, get essential work done, which is highly valued. Um, and I think we also sometimes get into this comparativeness of like, who's got it off, who's got it worse, right? But I think um, one of her points was around recognizing that everybody's experiencing loss right now, and it's just in different ways. Um, and her take home on that was that having empathy for yourself or someone else doesn't shortchange the empathy you can have, say, for a frontline worker or someone who's having to put themselves at imminent risk. And uh, I really liked how she put it that empathy for anyone adds to our shared pool of empathy. And I think just, you know, having that thought around the human experience and how we're all linked together and we're in this together, it really brought that home to me that, you know, every single person we interact with is dealing with it in a different way. And that having that shared empathy is really important. I freaking love that. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. That's a great answer. And Brene that Brown is, is, is one of the best. So, wow. That's, that's fantastic. A, that's a great way. That's a great way to, to, to wrap it up. So, Liz, <laughs> gosh, I mean, thank you so much for your insights. Thanks for, uh, for taking the time. This was so informative. Um, if, uh, if people want to find out more about you or the work that you do, is there uh, somewhere that people can go to find out? Uh, they can Google me. <laughs> 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 I don't have my own website. <laughs> um, so, gents, this is uh, so this is we've uh, we've made a, the decision that we're going to we're going to kind of wind down the COVID-19 related happy hours. Um, so this is our final this, happy hour of this version you know i was thinking oh this is like our again this is our phase one for sure phase one yes so we have had the absolute uh honor and privilege of mm -hmm. of coming to you guys you know at first five days a week and then three days a week um you know facebook live and, and we're so appreciative of everybody who has uh taken the time to watch um you know to watch live or to or to download the episodes after the fact and and i have just personally gotten so much out of uh all of these episodes um but now is the time that uh, we feel it's the right time to kind of steer away from the covid 
centric material and kind of get back to doing what we're doing. So, um, so number one is we got all new episodes of the business over beer podcast starting on June the 2nd. So that is three weeks from tonight. Yes. Three weeks from today. And then what else are we going to do, Ben? Are we going to bring the happy hour back? We are. We are going to do the new Bob happy hour. And that is, if Canope can move. Canope just needs to be part of the part of it, doesn't he? <laughs> That's also going to be on June 2nd at 530 on Facebook Live. Right here with the three of us. It's and we're going to be us. A little discussion, a little <laughs> Q&A. We hope that everybody will join and uh, we can catch up with all of you and you can catch up with all of us. We would love to have you join us and be a part of the happy hour. Absolutely. And, you know, there are, we have a lot of other things that, uh, that we're working on. So please stay tuned. Please stay close because there is uh, a lot more coming from the hat the hair and the head that is guaranteed. Yeah. But we are so grateful to everyone for listening uh, over the last 28 episodes of the happy hour. Are you kidding? Not kidding. So prost to everyone. Who oh has. my goodness. Prost. <laughs> prost. prost to everyone who's taking the time to be on the show and share their experiences with us. It's been, it's been un unbelievable. It's been really, really great. So thank sure. you. Thank you. Liz, thank you, and um, I, I have a, I've always, I've always respected what you've done and what you do, but I have a new respect for it now. <laughs> I do. One hundred percent. Thank you. Um, so thank you for for joining us. You're awesome. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Kaylor, Canope, people listening, people watching. I love you. We will see you later. Hey, hey should we tell them where they can find us? Well, you just did. Oh, okay. Oh, All right, no, right Kanope, where can they yeah. find Business they Over Beer? find beer. us at bizoverbeer.com. <laughs> Obviously, Kanope doesn't edit these episodes. Man, I tell you. Because he I'm he's just completely ruined the, the edit point. <laughs> we could have fixed course. it in post. I'm here to mess with you guys. Well, you're so, doing a good uh, job. Business Over Beer reminds you to always drink responsibly. And, Our uh, theme song has, is has Alley Cat by Soul Shifters. Yet. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you at the next Business Over Look. Beer Happy Hour. Can I answer it? I know the answer. <laughs> it's uh. beer. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like her.